This is Voicemail, the Universal Postal Union's podcast covering the wonderful world of mail. I'm your host, Ian Kerr. Humanitarian logistics is the core of our discussion in this episode. Sophie Gligorievich, Head of Logistics Division at the International Committee of the Red Cross, joins me to talk about delivering services in times of crisis. Joining me on the line is Sophie Gligorievich. Sophie is Head of the Logistics Division at the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC. Sophie, welcome to Voicemail. We always ask our guests first up, what's your earliest memory of the post? Whether it's a post office, the postal system, the postman, whatever. What's your earliest memory of the post? It's a very simple one. It's the postman coming and ringing at my parents' place to deliver the mail when I was uh, small. And he was a really nice guy, um, very helpful, that knew the family, knew where to drop the letter when uh, the neighbors were not around or when we were not around. And uh, it was every morning the same one. So we got uh, pretty used to that person. And uh, yeah, it's somehow someone that was not part of the family, but uh, part of um, the way we were living. Uh, we would see him every day and uh, every Christmas for the postal calendar, which is a tradition in France where we get uh, the calendar and we have to give a bit of money. And, um, and voila, I think that was my first memory. A very nice guy. Good one. Now let's move on to the topic of humanitarian logistics. So tell us, what is special about humanitarian logistics and how does this humanity or the idea of the humanitarian supply chain differ from the commercial one? That's an interesting question that I've been asked many times. And actually, I do not see that many differences between humanitarian supply chains and uh, commercial supply chains. Uh, we're all looking for the same thing, uh, which is to deliver the right thing at the right place at the right moment and at the right price. This being said, when we speak about humanitarian supply chain, uh, drivers for decision making differs from um, the commercial one, where it's more, much more driven uh, by cost efficiency. And when we are in emergency, it's not that we don't want to be cost efficient, don't misunderstand me, uh, but the main driver uh, for, the, for the choice of transport, for instance, or um, I mean, to establish the whole supply chain at the onset of the emergency, it's really uh, the delivery time. And that's what makes the main difference, that we have to deliver uh, at some point at any cost and by any means. And that's the main difference, as I would see it. Otherwise, it's, um, I mean, we work more or less uh, the same way. We look at the same thing. We have the same KPIs. It's, it's pretty much similar. Now, you've been with the ICRC for over a decade now. Over that time, what have you seen change? What has changed in the nature of humanitarian crises? And how is that then reflected in the supply chains? Uh, that might be in terms of new new challenges or new advances or innovations. So can you just set, share sort of a perspective on how things have changed over, over the last 10 years or so? What has changed is, I would say, the pressure on the supply chain because any other uh, market, organization, I mean, supply chain is really critical if you want to get your things where they should be when they should be there. And, uh, and it has become also critical for humanitarian organization where we got all of us much more structured than what we used to be uh, 10, 15 years ago. Um, before, most of the procurement was done in the field by people from the operation. Then we really created logistics supply chain function, which have evolved and are now very much professional. Um, we had to adapt to the new reality, which is uh, the need to be transparent on what is the supply chain uh, you're putting in place, what are you using, who are your uh, suppliers, uh, tier one, sometimes tier two, uh, or even further than this. Um, and you have to be transparent all along the process. And that's a huge change in terms of um, transparency, accountability, uh, compliance with uh, our rules, but also the rules of our 
donors. Uh, this has changed a lot and of course impacted the supply chain because we need to be um, much more able to explain what choice we made and why we made those choices that relates to accountability and uh, model compliance. We also have to consider the notions of uh, uh, sustainability, uh, impact on the local market, which were, um, of course, much less present like 15 years ago. Um, of course, because we need to be very much reactive, we have to uh, embrace what exists everywhere, which in our case is uh, ERP, uh, and that was a big uh, game changer for our own supply chain organization because, of course, it's a uh, move to standardization and it uh, forced us to change the profile of the people that we are hiring because we needed competencies that were not so much end on but uh, much more into uh, planning information system. So it, it became very specific. And we are dealing with many different supply chains because, of course, we have many um, operations together and we also have many different types of products. I see it's kind of an open catalog, so you can basically be requested to procure and bring on site absolutely anything. Any type of item can be requested uh, for our operations. So the diversity of the supply chain um, forced us to look into the competencies that we didn't have in-house and get specialized people from the outside world. And that was the major change uh, in the past 10, 15 years. It's really around the HR because being committed to um, the humanitarian mandate was not enough. We also needed to bring in competencies that we were not able to build in-house. When we talk about supply chain, we have to talk about technology and transformation. So how does the Red Cross embrace digital transformation in its logistics work in, out there in the field? Well, I think, um, again, we're not so different from what you can uh, see in the private sector. Uh, we're using ERP. We have now... Um, just deployed a uh, track and trace, uh, having EDI with some of our suppliers. So we're very much looking at what uh, digital technology are offering to us. Uh, it's, of course, of essence to have a better flow of uh, information. They materialize a number of transactions. Um, it's also key for us to be uh, sometimes more agile uh, and also faster because whatever can be digitalized reduces the, I mean, the, the, the manpower behind. So it makes us more efficient. So we're looking at everything that exists and what can be used. So we have basically our major ERP, our backbone ERP, and we are using a kind of satellite uh, solution for very specific um, very specific aspect of the supply chain, such as, uh, okay, we're looking now for procurement, we don't have it yet, uh, planning is on the way, uh, we have for transport, we also using for uh, air operations, fleet management. So whatever basically exists elsewhere is also uh, used in the ICRC. Um, when we speak about uh, digital transformation in the ICRC, it's something that um, is really looked at and uh, yeah, everything is being done for the ICRC to become digital and of course logistics follows the same path. But I think it's easier for logistics in the sense that more or less everything that we need exists elsewhere. The ICRC and the UPU are two of the oldest international organizations in the world. And I suppose we always talk about cooperation between international bodies when we're talking to uh, other, other groups that might interface somehow with the UPU. So from the ICRC's perspective, who are the main partners for the ICRC out there in the field? Hello, a personal uh, partner. Uh, the ICRC is part of uh, the movement, uh, the Cross-Red Crescent movement. So our partners in the field it's, we work a lot with the National Society um, in the field because they're the one helping us implementing 
our program and they're actually key for us to implement our program. So in terms of logistics, not so much because ICRC has everything in house and we have Okay, have a special uh, agreement with the country that uh, we're working in. Um, but in terms of implementing the program when it comes to distribution, ensuring proper distribution, we rely a lot on the national society in the countries we are working with. So that the main operational partner. Now we're working, of course, a lot with other humanitarian uh, organizations. Um, we have some special agreements with uh, some of them for very specific program or uh, support services, uh, like uh, when it comes to air operation, we would work uh, a lot with MSF on uh, sharing planes for uh, cost efficiency, for instance. So the partners in the field, it's mainly humanitarian organization and of course partners from the movement. And you just mentioned MSF, Doctors Without Borders as we often refer to them in English. Uh, Continuing this theme of collaboration and cooperation, what about cooperation with the posts, whether it's in a donor country or a country that's been affected by a disaster or wherever it is that the Red Cross is delivering its services? Do you have any examples of collaboration and cooperation between the ICRC and uh, postal operators? We're using actually postal services mainly for uh, cash distribution, because um, that's one of the ways uh, humanitarian organization and the ICRC intervene in the field. And we are having a fairly large part of our operation that's done through cash distribution and the different modalities. And when we go out and look for financial service provider, post office are usually some of those that we're trying to, um, to contact and engage with. And uh, sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not, because it very much also depends on technology available in country. But they usually have a very strong and uh, large network. So very often they can reach places um, where others might not be able to reach um, because they have this huge network. So we are using them in a uh, in few countries, in uh, Armenia, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Philippines, um, and um, and we also use them a lot in this type of modality because they allow us sometimes to do, um, I mean, they can deliver cash to our beneficiary because that's part of the service they are providing themselves. So we contract them for such uh, services. Over the last two years, the pandemic, the COVID-19 situation has dominated so many aspects of our lives. So... Has the ICRC been involved in the response to the the, the, the pandemic or even in vaccine delivery? Uh, have you partnered with any other uh, operators uh, or providers in, in helping out with the, the response to the COVID-19 pandemic? We've been, of course, involved in the response, mainly, again, for our own operation um, because, okay, some other of the mandate for the, for the COVAX um, uh, and we did not deliver vaccine because there was all this um, yeah, this organization uh, with the COVAX initiative that uh, is in charge of uh, ensuring the delivery of vaccine in the country where we're operating. But for ourselves and our own operation, of course, as early as the pandemic um, was known, we started to procure whatever uh, personal protective equipment uh, was needed for our staff in the field and uh, some of the structure that uh, we were supporting when we speak about supporting hospital, for instance. Um, so that's the main thing we've been doing and it kept us pretty busy last year um, where we were very active on the PPE market uh, trying to source whatever was needed. And of course, again, there the supply chain makes difference because I think our all the capacities of the supply chain in-house made us much more agile uh, than some other organization that would, for instance, have to rely on um, another transport organization. We can organize our own transport, for instance. And that, this was key for us um, because we have people present in the country where we would source and the capacity to organize our own transport ourselves, not with our own boat, but uh, um, 
we were not dependent on uh, on other logistical companies, and that makes us much more agile and much faster. Um, in terms of the vaccine, again, we did not deliver the vaccine, but we supported uh, with a syringe needle, uh, and this went very smoothly because that was less on an emergency than the PPE uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. You mentioned earlier that uh, sustainability is part of the thinking at ICRC. So just returning to this topic for a moment and sustainable development in particular, how does the ICRC integrate sustainability into its own supply chain? It has been a very hot topic for quite some years and today it's uh it's one of the priority of our logistics division to make sure that we can integrate sustainability. And in this regard, we have a project that is called Sustainable Supply Chain, so it's with other members of the, of the movement. And uh, it's embedded within the ICRC, but it's for the whole movement. And what we've been working on more specifically in that project, but also in the ICRC, it's around the fleet because we have a huge uh, fleet everywhere in the world um, and trying to rationalize this fleet, making sure that we do not have extra vehicles, for instance, and trying to introduce uh, electric vehicles in some uh, contexts where this is possible, uh, working a lot on the um, waste management. Um, because that's one of the big concerns when it comes to sustainability. But we're trying to work on sustainability at every step of the supply chain. So, of course, the planning is for us uh, essence because if we do a good planning, we can choose the best transportation mode and we can reduce um, carbon emission thanks to good planning. So that's also something that we are reinforcing a lot. Uh, we're working a lot on the audit of uh, our supplier to make sure that um, they correspond to our standard in terms of uh, not only about uh, pure sustainability, but of course, uh, other um, quality, health, and environmental standards. Um, so it's pretty much everywhere in the supply chain. We also de- we have developed carbon accounting um, tool, and this one is being used. But there's a lot that is being done in the ICRC, in the movement, and I think across all the humanitarian uh, organizations. Returning then to the post, posts will always be looking to collaborate where possible. Uh, so when, when responding to a, whether it's a local crisis or helping out with a global crisis, whatever it might be. So how can posts collaborate with the ICRC? And I suppose which areas do you see that uh, would call for the most support or where could the post support most? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're really using uh, the bus is actually for the delivery of our program, okay? Because um, when we have a strong network of uh, postal offices that is well developed and that can provide uh, some services such as financial services, uh, cash distribution, bank transfer, um, this is a service that we need. And then there is an area for really working with post office in this domain, as far as the ICS is concerned, um, because that's something, again, they usually have this extended coverage. They know the community we are working with um, because they're on the ground and they're close to the people. And I revert to my first answer um, to Postman when I was told by someone that was part of our life. You know, it would be there every morning and everyone would knew it. And in some of the contexts that we're working, uh, the local post office is known by everyone. People know each other in smaller communities. So that's a very powerful network that we can rely on. And in that sense, it's, uh, I mean, from my perspective and what I'm doing, so which is um, providing our operation with what they need to support uh, our beneficiaries, this is the main area where I can see there is a great potential. That's a, a really interesting insight into the world of humanitarian logistics and indeed how the posts can play their part in helping the, the world respond to local and global crises. 
Sophie Grigorievic, Head of Logistics Division at the International Committee of the Red Cross. Thank you very much for joining us on the UPU Voicemail Podcast today. Thanks a lot to you and thanks to providing the opportunity of giving some insight on our work. You've been listening to Voicemail, the official podcast of the Universal Postal Union. Subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast platform and you'll get each episode downloaded to the device of your choosing as it's released. My thanks to the team at the UPU for their help putting together this episode. I'm your host, Ian Kerr, and I look forward to your company next time on Voicemail, the podcast of the UPU. Thank you.